I'm Lynn Smith, and welcome to Bigfoot Case Files. A friend told me this story several years ago, and I've been fascinated by it ever since. He's a very serious and hardworking family man, and I'm quite sure he's never told this story to anyone else except his family. They are very private-like, and he only told me of it after I've hunted with him for three years or so. I hunt in Minnesota for white-tailed deer and turkey, and I'm an avid outdoorsman for most of my life since my teens. I myself have never seen one of these creatures, but I always thought that I would someday. So here goes. My friend was about 18 or 19 at the time. He lived on a farm in northern Minnesota, about 35 miles west of Duluth. This would have been about 1975 or 76. The surrounding area has occasional small farms and hay fields, but is mostly wooded with large areas of timber and swampland. Logging for paper mills and an occasional gravel pit are around as well. My friend had finished working on haying the fields and evening chores around the farm. He was taking a sauna at the end of the day. That was custom for many of the Finnish people in the area. The sauna was located in the back of one of the 40-acre parcels that the family owned. It was near a stream. My friend was sitting just outside the sauna, naked and cooling off. Usually, he would do a few sessions of heating up and cooling off. The area was not visible from the road, as it was in a lower elevation and could not be seen, so they had privacy. He said that he had an eerie feeling come over him that someone was watching him, and he turned to look behind him toward the sauna. He said he saw the head and shoulders of someone looking at him from over the eave of the sauna. He immediately said, I see you, and he yells his brother's name. Then he realized it was definitely not his brother. It was dark, hairy, and tall. He felt an instant fear as his mind registered bear. Then, in a second, he thought, a bear could not be that tall. The eave of the sauna was about six and a half feet high, and this being, whatever it was, was two or three feet taller than the sauna roof line at the eave. It was evening, and the light was just turning twilight, but he could see details fairly well. He thought about rushing back to the sauna to get his clothes and get out of there, but didn't want to go towards the creature. Finally, he ran back inside and got his clothes on as fast as he could. He felt like it was staring at him through the small window, and he did not want to look at it. He ran back to the road and jumped into his truck and sped to the farmhouse, about three quarters of a mile west. He got his dad and two brothers, and they grabbed lanterns and flashlights and shotguns and sped back to the sauna to see if they could see anything. It was just now dark, and they didn't see any sign of it. They looked for tracks, but the area was grassy. All there was was flattened areas of grass, no footprints. They never saw anything again. It remains a mystery. My friend said that he remembered for a short time that in early fall, the school bus driver would occasionally see something big and tall and dark walking upright on the gravel roads on his route. One time he remembered he sped up to the spot where he thought it went into the woods and he flung the bus doors open to listen and they heard something crashing away into the timber. So that's it. I've always since wondered what exactly did he see. I've always been interested in his story and other sightings similar to what he saw. I have many questions about Bigfoot, like what are they? The female DNA and unknown male DNA? How many are there? How do they reproduce and rear their young? How do they survive the harsh winters? The Nephilim connection? What do they see when they say it was a female? Breasts? Curved hips? Many other thoughts. How do they communicate? Language, intelligence, etc. A common bad smell, and on and on. Anyway, best regards. I'm always searching for the truth. Dean. I had a face-to-face -face meeting with an overly large and exceptionally spooky mountain monster, and I can now honestly say I met a Sasquatch. I spent the last 15 years living on the Oregon coast, and although we moved here from Northern California, where the people are not all that different, the lifestyle is more relaxed here, and I've been able to hike in some truly wild areas. I can see why this strange animal is seen and reported, yet still remains unknown, because it lives where most people would never go. I would never have seen the one I did had it not happened that I sort of dropped in on it. 
Occasionally, I enjoy going back in some fairly non-scenic places where I won't run into constant troops of other hikers, photographers, exercise fanatics, and kids. Having lived most of my life in and around population, sometimes it's nice to be just alone. To do that in the mountains of Oregon is difficult, because it's just too beautiful. So sometimes I look for the seemingly unattractive places in hopes to find an unusual rock formation, gnarly tree branch, or just maybe find something that four million other people haven't seen. Well, this trip was even more than I could have bargained for. It was up on what is called Bald Knob in the Rogue River Siskiyou National Forest area. I had taken my old willies up a road that was more of a trail, but not inviting, I'm sure to most people, because this particular route was full of large-sized rocks. I was fairly high and I could see Humbug Mountain, but this area was just not anything that would draw visitors, so it was just what I was searching for. The road on the other side of this hill got worse, so I knew I had a private area to explore. I parked off the ruts and grabbing my pack set off into what looked like a really secluded canyon. The road soon ended and there was a shallow gulch that led to my left and I found myself in a beautifully sheltered canyon that was virtually covered with pine trees. There seemed to be a well-traveled animal trail that kept steadily descending in this ever-deepening canyon, so I figured I couldn't get lost by staying on it, so I spent about two hours following it. I had to go quite slow, I had to go quite slow, so I'm not sure how far down I was when I heard the sound of water splashing off to my right, and it seemed like it was almost directly below me. Leaving the trail, I slowly climbed, hand over hand, over a couple of huge boulders laying on the steep slope, and the sounds got louder, and now I could see part of a small waterfall coming from the cliff on my upper right. So I carefully went around the huge boulder. I had to hold on to its side with my fingers as my feet kept slipping on the steep gravel slope as I made my way slowly down until I was directly under the boulder, and then my hands could no longer find anything on which to hold as the rock was too smooth. My feet kept slipping on the open stretch of gravel, and then I lost it. I landed on my butt and slid on my back down about 30 feet at a fast pace, and then I dropped right off an abrupt edge and landed hard enough to take the wind out of me. But fortunately, I only dropped about three feet to where I thudded down and where I sat, waiting for the stars to clear. I landed on a small ledge, and below my outstretched legs, the slope dropped down to a very steep funnel-like chute through a really bad-looking channel that was lined with huge rock walls. It looked like if you fell down that slope, you would have to keep going all the way to the bottom of the mountain. Fortunately for me, although I had a lot of pain, I wasn't broken. Gathering my senses, I looked around me, and there on my right was a small pool that a trickling stream had been splashing into, and then it flowed off the corner of a five-foot pond and disappeared from view off the backside. This is here that I saw the subject of my letter to you. Over a huge boulder to the side of the pond, and about thirty feet up, there was a huge, light brown, haired head. It had an ugly face, more like a large gorilla-like animal with rather large eyes and ears, a kind of flat nose with big nostrils and large but flat ears. I couldn't see its hands or arms, and it had to be either laying up there or standing behind that large rock, but all I saw was this very calm but seemingly curious animal. I say that because it had a smooth, dark-skinned face and its brow was wrinkled like an aging human would look. Then I got courage and very calmly said, Hello. As nervous as I was, I was now more anxious at finding something I've never believed really existed. Well, I guess I should have let it make the first move, because the animal, all of a sudden, rose up a couple of feet, turned, and disappeared. All I saw was a lot of hair, but the rest of its body was behind the rock. Then I heard a couple of thumps, like it must have jumped and ran downhill, and then nothing. I was not in good enough shape to try to climb up to where it had been, even if I had gathered enough courage but I had scrapes and bloody spots all over me. I was just very lucky to have not broken anything except maybe my butt. I've never had so many abrasions and bruises at one time before in my life, and I carefully and painfully made my way back to the willies. I think I must have taken three times as long to get home, and it took over a month for the wounds to heal. You know, the funny thing about this is, my next-door neighbor is a retired Oregon State employee 
and he happened to be mowing his yard when I pulled into my driveway. And when he saw me slowly and painfully climbing out of my Jeep, he came quickly over. I told him the whole story and asked him who I should tell about what happened, thinking I'd at least make the news. He started shaking his head and told me I'd better just forget it ever happened because no one will ever print it or even accept my story. He wouldn't even allow me to use his name. He'd been a retired forestry worker and he was under a lifetime restriction against reporting, discussing, or even acknowledging the existence of Bigfoot. As I stood there bleeding and suffering bodily and now mentally, he explained that a great many of the BLM, forestry, and other state employees have seen and encountered these creatures. The ruling about non-disclosure and absolute denial has been in effect ever since the first sighting was reported. The policy has a multiple purpose, and after hearing him out, I could understand the devastation that would occur if the state agencies admitted to the existence of these beings. The forests would be flooded with hunters, and shootings would be rampant. People would create such destruction that it would be chaotic. After listening to his well-rehearsed presentation, I could see it was not his first recital, and I then understood why I too need to respect what I had experienced. Sunday, May 28, 2023, between 7 and 8 a.m., I was driving north on Peshtigo Brook Road, where it comes to a 90-degree corner to the left where it turns into North Branch Road. To the left, North Branch Road also goes off to the right, but is more of a UTV ATV trail. The road ahead off the corner, Izzy's Lane, is a gravel road. This area in northern Oconto County, Wisconsin, is mostly wooded with swamp near the Oconto River. As I neared the corner, I saw a black and brown large figure of a man that I thought may have been someone that broke down on the trail as it was walking south toward Pistigo Brook Road. I stopped at the corner as I could not believe what I was looking at. Trying to wrap my head around it and convincing myself it was a man as it was walking on two legs and had taken from what I saw about ten steps toward me. However, there was no sound, no yelling for help or waving of the arms, and no human-colored skin. It was in fact a dark black and brown figure with large legs, even at the base towards the feet. It was not a bear and it was not a human. I looked around the corner and I could see in the distance down North Branch Road that a human was walking east toward me in that direction. I then looked back and the large black-brown figure went into the ditch and disappeared. I was convinced it had to be a Sasquatch. There's one residence further down that road on the left-hand side. However, this was before that property. Talking further with another local, the individual that lives on that property is in a wheelchair. Almost mesmerized and confused at what I saw, I never got my phone out to take a picture. It never crossed my mind, and now I question why. Why hadn't I tried to take a picture? That will be forever the question. As I then continued down my drive, coming closer to the human walking down North Branch toward Pistigo Brook Road, it was a woman who I could very clearly see the skin on and was initially from the corner farther from me than the black and brown Sasquatch. Several hours later, I drove back that way to see if I could see any footprints or evidence of what I saw. However, with the holiday weekend, everything was covered in ATV and UTV tracks. I did notice there was a fence that went along the ditch side going into the woods, but it was cut out in several locations. My two friends and I were camping near Busick, North Carolina, just east of the Smoky Mountain National Park. We were northeast of Asheville, near the Blue Ridge Parkway. On the first of the two nights we were there, we heard weird yells going through the woods right after dark. Later, while we were sitting near the campfire playing dominoes, we heard the same yell and heard rustling in the woods nearby. We couldn't distinguish what it was because there were some people singing Christian hymns at a small nearby theater. Later that night, when I was asleep, my friends, who were brothers, were talking about the upcoming wedding of one of them this coming spring, and the younger brother says he saw it move through the woods very close to our camp. He told me about it the next day, and I got kind of scared, since I've seen a Bigfoot in New Mexico back in 1994 while in the Boy Scouts. The next day, the two brothers went on a long hike, and I stayed in camp since I was experiencing foot problems and had no hiking boots. 
I got really bored, so I decided to walk down what seemed to be a game trail into the woods for a few hundred yards. I noticed that there were a lot of trees that were broken, like something had bent them. None of these trees were very thick, but there were a few that I knew I could not snap. I started to get a little scared, like something wasn't right. I was only about a quarter mile from the campground, and then I saw it. It scared the crap out of me. I only saw it for about 10 to 15 seconds, maybe. I was so scared, it could have been five seconds, or it could have been a minute. And the best way to describe it would be that it looked like a Bigfoot from Harry and the Hendersons, only it was heavier and a little bit darker. I was probably about 15 to 30 feet from it when I saw it. We stared at each other for the duration of my sighting, and then it walked away as if I wasn't anything to worry about. I stood in that spot for a while and then walked back to the campsite, stopping every now and then to look around for the thing. I told my friends about it, and after describing the thing, the one brother who saw it the night before said that it was probably the same thing he saw. My name is Kelsey. My fiancé and myself were stargazing at the Wilderness Center in Wilmont, Ohio. We went with plans of having a relaxing evening, which didn't turn out so well. This was July 17, 2019. We had our usual picnic just before dusk, and the sky was to be clear, perfect for stargazing. We went about our meal and then continued down the trail. As night fell, we started to hear a strange knocking, almost like rocks being thrown against trees. My fiancé got spooked immediately, so we started up the path back to our car, which was about a quarter mile away. Then we heard a few strange screams, and we started to move a bit quicker. We had no idea of what it was. It was just like the start of a horror movie. As we got closer to the car, we heard breaking of branches and the smell of something that wasn't so pleasant. When we got close to our vehicle, we immediately started trying to open it from there, knowing that something wasn't right. As we got almost to the vehicle, it showed itself behind us, standing about seven and a half feet tall with brownish gray fur. It let out such a guttural growl at us that I can't begin to say how scary it was. There's no words for it. It was about 3 a.m. It was in sight for less than five seconds. Needless to say, we left in a hurry. We heard another scream as we pulled away. Thank you, Kelsey. I heard of Sasquatch when my dad took me to see the Patterson film as a kid, but never really believed or even thought much about the subject till I had my encounter. It all happened back in the summer of 2002, but I remember it like yesterday. One day, while picking up my pay in the war room at Fort Indian Town Gap, I overheard news that my National Guard unit was about to get orders to deploy as part of Operation Enduring Freedom. At that time, I was a rifleman with Company C, 111th Infantry, 56th Striker Brigade, out of Cutstown, Pennsylvania. I'd currently volunteered for state active duty as part of Operation Noble Eagle, guarding the Limerick Generating Station. I was carrying full combat load on that detail for almost a year when I asked to be relieved. At the time, I wanted to deploy with my unit, you know, that whole band of brothers thing, plus the retirement points and veterans' benefits increase if you're deployed in combat. A 42-year-old infantryman and wanting to be sent out to an area of hostile fire. Now that I look back, I guess I was a little nuts. It was then when a friend offered to take me on a weekend camping trip to a little pay campsite along the banks of the west branch of the Susquehanna. It was meant to be a relaxing trip before I deployed, and while there, we would drink a few beers, look for Indian arrowheads in the nearby fields, and he was also going to give me a flint napping lesson. We soon got bored walking the area after only finding a few broken projectile points and some chippings. There was an excellent flowing feeder stream emptying into the river just downstream called Big Run, and I wanted to explore it. I've been hunting arrowheads for many years, and have found that almost every stream and spring in Pennsylvania has a small Native American hunting camp at the head where the water first pops out of the ground. It was scorching hot that day, and my friend got tired after a mile or so, and he wanted to turn back. I, however, was determined to find a camp and went on alone. I followed the stream for another mile or two, when eventually it got so thick with rhododendron, it became nearly impossible to follow. At that point, I started to hear the sound of a highway, way off in the distance, and found a crushed soda can in the stream. 
From the can, I came to the conclusion that the head of the stream was somewhere on the right side of the highway and further away than I was prepared to travel. At the bottom of the mountain, I remember seeing an old logging road that ran up the gorge to the left of the stream. I decided that would be the easier and quickest way back down to the river. After fighting my way through the thick undergrowth, I finally found an old logging path that was about 200 yards to the left of the stream. As soon as I located the trail, I found a nice flat spot that had a push pile for making the road, so I decided to scratch around in the pile to see if I could find any traces of flint chips in the soil. I have discovered whole arrowheads in these topsoil piles in the past at other locations. All I found in that pile that day was a few small northern ring-necked snakes. It was getting even hotter and I was almost out of water, so I decided to pack up my scratcher and head back down the mountain. Not two steps into my journey back, standing about 60 yards in front of me, was the most terrifying experience in my life. Honestly, I would like to think that I'm a reasonably brave man, but I was not prepared for this encounter at all. Being an experienced infantry soldier and an avid big game hunter, it takes a lot to rattle me. What I saw standing in front of me shook me to my very core, and I instantly froze. A flood of thoughts went through my mind in a second. I wanted it to be a bear in the worst way, just like I've seen many times before, but it just wasn't a bear. When I realized what it was, overwhelming fear hit me, and I felt like I was going to vomit. When it turned and started running toward the stream where I had just come from, I couldn't believe the speed it achieved in such a short time. I could clearly see the two muscular legs running because the deer had everything browsed off as high as they could reach. The legs alone had to be as tall as me. I'm 5'6", so this thing was probably almost 6 feet just to the waist. Being a long-time bear hunter, I think this creature had to weigh anywhere from 800 to 1,200 pounds minimum and stood approximately 9 to 11 feet tall. The legs were thick and muscular and reminded me of hair-covered telephone poles. The hair appeared to be dark brown or maybe black, and I'm thinking no more than four inches long. It sounded like a bulldozer busting through the rhododendron, snapping branches as thick as my ankles. I remember thinking, there is no way I can outrun this thing, and if it wanted to, it could easily catch me. Being unarmed at this time didn't help with the fear factor, and at that point, I knew if I survived that day, I would never venture into the woods unarmed again. I knew I had to get back to camp. I had to go toward where this thing was just standing a second before. I remember thinking the sounds I heard earlier that I thought were deer must have been this creature following me. When I made that left uphill to get out of the rhododendron, I must have inadvertently flanked it. My thoughts were that this thing was stalking me. That's when the almost 20 years of infantry training kicked in. You see, in an ambush situation, you always charge into the contact and never go any other direction because that's where the real trap is. Sounds crazy, but at that point, I just bolted in the direction of where I first saw it. To tell you the truth, I didn't know that I could even run that fast. I never also looked back because I was in full panic mode, but I knew if I didn't slow down a little, I would eventually fall because it was rocky and downhill. I remember thinking if I fell... I would inevitably be injured severely and in bigger trouble. Somehow, I regained my composure and slowed myself down a little, but kept running for what felt like three miles till I came to the river. Funny, I never told my buddy that took me on the trip about it. I'm not even sure why I kept it to myself. Now that I think about it, I'm not sure if I got a good look at its face at all, or if I did, I must have somehow blocked it out of my memory because I was so scared. I think I may have gone into slight shock because I felt sick instantly. I know it saw me first. As soon as I started heading down the logging path towards it, I heard it move and I looked up. At the same time, it turned to its right and took off like a bat out of hell. It busted through that rhododendron at amazing speed. What would have taken me 15 minutes to climb and weave through, it plowed through in seconds. I think the sound of the snapping branches made it even worse knowing the power that would take to snap those thick branches. I've had nightmares about this guy, and in them, its face looked more human than not, and the head was shaped like a coconut still in the outer shell. 
In the dreams, it's never aggressive, but it still scares the hell out of me with its enormous size. I know one thing, if I would have had a camera, I would never have had the time to take a picture, nor would I have tried. It was too close, and it happened too fast. I hope I never see another, at least not that close. I've heard that they are supposed to smell bad, but I didn't smell anything out of the ordinary. The hair was not as long as I've heard in other reports either. Maybe by early summer the hair is shorter, I don't know. I even get a feeling that perhaps that area is part of a migration route, but I have no idea where that idea even came from. I think that's why I couldn't find Indian hunting camps along that stream. Maybe the Indians knew and stayed away. Even to this day, every time I go hunting or into the woods, that creature is in the back of my mind. I swear to God, this is 100% true to the best of my recollection. Jeff Thanks for listening. Be sure to watch the three-hour December prize giveaway video. Same as before, watch the video and comment the secret word and your favorite story. Happy holidays and good luck.